New Zealand. To many it seems like a slice of heaven. But behind the beautiful landscapes and social freedoms, we are keeping an ugly secret. I want to investigate the mindset that has created one of the most promiscuous nations in the world. I want to see how people in this nation view sex and relationships and what the costs are. I want to talk to the people who deal with the consequences of a nation that statistically root like rabbits. I want to go to the places most people won't go because I want to get to the bottom of this issue. This is Dunedin. I've lived in the city for the last five years and I know what this culture is like. Many people are out here for sex and looking everywhere for it. The one place you'll definitely find people having sex is a brothel. So here we are at the front of La Maison, which is a brothel in Dunedin. We've got an interview with one of the girls who works here. What is the most attractive thing about this industry? Um, all the different people you meet. It's fun, the money's very good. How many people do you see per night? We can have up to 20 to 25 come in here a night. Why do you think there's a need for people to come here? Um, well, it's only nature, isn't it? Everyone's got a need. A lot of out-of-towners come that work, that can't have relationships because of their jobs, you know, because they're never always out of town. As I said, it's not all about sex. We get some that want to come up here and have sex, and they leave. No strings attached, of course, you know. A lot of young ones these days, that's probably better for them. At least up here at Safe Sex, where they're not out in the street, just doing whatever, and, yeah. And, um... And then we get the ones that just want to come up here and want that female companionship, someone to talk to. Do you think the work that you're doing now might affect your relationships later on in life? No, no, because this is work. Your emotions and your feelings aren't going into it. It's all about, um, yeah, you're here to make the other person happy. And also there's the money side of it, so I don't let my emotions get involved. I mean, you're a different person when you're up here, so it's like you're, in, you're acting the whole time. What, in your opinion, is the effect of the sex industry on relationships in the community? Say someone comes in here and has sex, how will that affect their relationships in the community? Well, it's no different. The only thing is there's no strings attached. Sex here, yeah. So you can walk out there and say what you want when you want. Yeah, you don't have that person to answer to or, yeah. It's fine to hear how brothel workers deal with sex and relationships, but the reality is, for most people my age, they're not going to pay for sex. Why visit a brothel when you can get sexual experience for free? Over the following weeks, I want to head out onto the streets and gain a bit of perspective of what the average person thinks about sex and relationships. I had sex when I was 14, and now I look back at it and think, what was, why did I do that? Yeah, I was like, like there when I was sort of doing it. I was just like, yeah, what the hell was like, the point in that? And how old were you? I was 13, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Four days after my 13th birthday, I regret it. <laughs> I'm asking, so what happens in the hall? Um... You sleep with everyone on your floor. <laughs> <laughs> you heard that. No, but I know people, and yeah, they sleep with everyone on the floor. Yeah. Well. What do you think nowadays people are after in a relationship? Uh, what age group? Just for yourself? Well, for myself, at, this, at my age group, I, I believe that everyone is after sex first. And then face value, you know, if they're all good, you know, they might go out with them, but that's about it. Teenage pregnancy is sick. It's disgusting. Do you think teenagers should be having sex then? Yeah. But if you can't take the consequences for the action, why, why have the action? Safe sex. So if you put a condom on, it's all good? Yeah. If, if you're sleeping with multiple people, you need to take the responsibility to check every so often. Yeah. Go to the doctors, you know, and, yeah. and be responsible about it because it's, it's not fair, really. If I read a hot trick of the cook, stay there. Even if I never come, she should never come. Pretty much, I saw my mates that. Straight there. No questions. Yeah. Either good sex or a lot uh, of sex. Girl. Because sex is like pizza. If it works bad, it's still pretty good. Do you think at age 17 you're old enough to make decisions like to have sex? Yeah. 
No. Oh. Because like, that's a common that's misconception. Good. Everyone thinks, oh, girls are in a relationship with guys that are there for one night stands. That's not, 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 not true. That's not true. That is not true at all. At all. The student atmosphere in New Zealand is, is, you know, have go study, but it's more about having fun, especially in Otago, you know. Who wants to have sex with someone that you're not going to marry? I mean, what's the point of that? You're just going to ruin yourself. Or well, what would you do if you found out she was pregnant? Yeah. Support her anyway I could, really. I mean, be there for her. Why would you say girls at such a young age go out and have sex? Because everyone's doing it. I reckon, to be completely honest. Do you think it's going to affect us in the long run? Maybe down the track when we might want to settle down? No, I don't, because I think it's been happening for years and that's just the way of human life. It's been another big night out in town. People are out on the piss and they're loose. People don't think that there are consequences to a night like this, but there are. I know this. In my first year at uni, one of my friends got pregnant. It was an unplanned pregnancy, and in the end, she decided to not go through with it. So what I want to do next is get in touch with the hospital. I want to talk to somebody who has to deal with some of the consequences after a night like tonight. So I'm pretty stoked right now. Uh, we just got an email back from the hospital and we've been communicating with those guys the last few weeks. And um, it's happened. They've agreed for us to come in later this week to have an interview with one of the GPs. What is your role within the Dunedin community? I work part-time as a GP. I also, for the last 18 and a half years, have been working, been working in the abortion service here in Dunedin. What was the one thing that stood out for you when this job opportunity came up? Well, the most important thing was to maintain a service because if you don't have a safe legal abortion service, women still make decisions about abortion and then you end up with unsafe abortions where women take things into their own hands. Mm -hmm. While about 67,000 women a year die from unsafe abortion. But they feel bad enough in themselves, like they, they feel annoyed, angry, feel stupid, embarrassed that they've got themselves in this position often in the first place. At the end of the process, just seeing them, the relief and their gratitude and their realising that they can now get on with their lives, having thought that their lives are going to totally fall apart. Um, it's just really rewarding. So it is the most rewarding work I do. I really feel that. How many abortions do you see? The Otago District Health Board has a contract with the Ministry of Health, and I think it's for around about 580 abortions a year, 12 procedures a week in total, the whole area. What would you say are the long-term implications for someone who's had an abortion? As far as long-term sequelae or complications from abortion, there's actually very few. And there may be a possible increase, small increase, in the risk of women who in subsequent pregnancies may go into premature labour um, or have low birth weight babies. And there's no evidence that it affects your ability to get pregnant in the future. It does not cause any increase in breast cancer. And then, of course, people worry about the psychological sequelae of long-term psychological concerns. Do people regret this? That women who have had abortions have a higher instance of um, depression, anxiety, and various mental health issues, uh, drug use issues. It wasn't particularly the abortion per se that was causing the problems, but it was other things going on around it. So there's no strong evidence of long-term psychological sequelae as a result of abortion per se. Do you meet with them after the procedure to see how they're doing? It's... we don't. Women are... in New Zealand women are entitled to a free checkup two weeks after their abortion. And it's the same worldwide, actually. Only about 30% of women go for those post-abortion checkups. But in fact, what happens is women go back to their, G, their own GPs for that follow-up check. It would be great to actually see them, but A, the system's not set up, and B, they tend not to come because everything's going OK. Dr. Downs makes it pretty clear that her service is of great value to the community. From what she said, it seems that there are little to no long-term consequences in having an abortion. I want to explore this issue further. I want to go as far as I can. I want to see what people I can talk to. 
and what information I can get my hands on. If this is going to happen, I'm going to need to head out of the Dunedin. I've been in touch with Dr. Albert Macari, one of the top gynaecologists in the South Island. I came across Dr. Macari on national television when he appeared on the program Sunday. A cultural revolution. And what's encouraging me is the public response. I am on my way to Timaru to hear what he has to say about sex and relationships. He has said himself that he has one of the best seats in the house to see what is going on. The attitudes of the people that I've come across on the street and both professionals as well is that there's very few consequences to the way we're having sex. And if there are consequences, we can treat them. What do you think about this? Yes, you can treat physical and medical conditions. So if somebody gets, for example, chlamydia STD, you can treat it. What about the promiscuity as a risk factor, which nobody is addressing it in the country, is promiscuity the way we are handling it now an issue or not? In my opinion, it is a huge issue. In other people's opinion, it's a sport. Uh, you can do it so long as you are wearing the right gear. It is not coincidence that where there is the highest promiscuity in the place where the average number of sexual partners is 22 for a girl, you have one of the least stable relationship. So relationship become, relationships become very disposable and the ability to maintain a family as a building block of society gets out of the window. How is this affecting us and our society? You will have higher incidence of depression. So we have 1.2 million scripts for depression in one year. You will have one of the highest used suicide rates in the world. You will have a lot of family violence, 125,000 called for family violence last year. What are the problems and what is causing this? Sleeping with people you don't know which, with all the consequences uh, of that promiscuity. Nobody is commenting as a social implication of promiscuity and the physical implication of promiscuity related to the failure to maintain relationship, the disposability of relationship, and the inability to have a family as a building block of society. I'm talking about sex and relationships, but you mentioned substance abuse and family violence. Why is that? It's all linked, it's all cause-effect. You get drunk, you lose your inhibition, you have sex with somebody you don't know, you could catch an STD or get pregnant, and if you don't, you get used to the idea of sleeping around, you don't maintain relationship, your relationship becomes disposable, you cannot maintain a family because you used to, be, to sleep around, you are not going to maintain a high index of fidelity, you will get divorced or you will not be able to be in long-term relationship, this be conducive to more family violence, youth suicide, depression, you name it. What about the people who just want to have fun? You can have fun driving a car at 200 kilometers on the motorway. It, I'm sure it will be a lot of fun, but is it a good idea or a bad idea? You can have fun going and robbing a bank, but it's a good idea or a bad idea? While we have fun, there has to be some sort of code of social responsibility. There has to be some sort of speed limit. This is not about limiting people's freedom. This is about the idea of abuse of freedom. If you downgrade sex from lovemaking in a meaningful relationship to paddock mating, you end up in a human paddock. It's obvious that you have a very strong opinion about this, but my question is, how did you get to these conclusions? Well, I have been studying this over the last three years, and here is a folder with the names of the studies and the names of the people I suggest that you communicate with who have dedicated their life or a big chunk of it studying these problems. Each of them is an expert in his own field. Take the folder and the addresses and the names and the titles of the study and have a look for yourself and see if I'm talking nonsense or whether I'm talking sense. I'm not here discussing religion or God or marriage, I'm discussing civilization, I'm discussing mana. I am saying that there is a better way of playing this. What is the point in suffering all this pain? What is the point in having all this unhappiness? That's what I'm talking about.
Well, it's uh, pretty obvious that Albert's got some strong opinions. Um, I'll be keen to check out these contacts, but um, right now it's 2 a.m. I'm gonna find a hotel and crash for the night and we can pick this thing up in the morning. I've got a meeting with Carolina from the Post-Abortion Trauma Healing Service in Christchurch. PATHS provides various forms of support for people affected by the loss of preborns. Earlier, Dr. Downs told me that the majority of girls don't go back to the hospital because everything's okay. But today I want to see if Carolina shares this view. What was the motivation for starting PATHS? Actually hearing a woman's story about her experience moved me quite deeply and I, I got an insight into the needs for healing for people who have been affected. It's actually the lived reality of people who have actually gone through it and, um, and the effect that it's had on them and their lives and their relationships and their futures their hopes, dreams, everything. But again, I think it's often not recognised and it's often dismissed or minimised, even by health professionals sometimes. And I think that's partly because it's so caught up in this kind of political moral framework rather than actually just dealing with it, with the individual and how it may have affected them as a life experience. Why do you think there's been an increase in abortion in recent years? Well, I imagine there's a lot of factors. I mean, there's a lot of social trends and changes attitudes to sex, relationship shifts and changes, attitudes to motherhood, um, maybe the feminist movement. But also I think too because we now have um, abortion provided as a part of our health service and abortion has become kind of normalised. What areas of a person's life is affected by abortion? Their sense of themselves, their self-esteem and sense of self-worth, some struggle with um, self-loathing or self-hatred kind of issues. Depression appears to be quite a significant um, outcome. In relationship issues sometimes can be a real problem for people and again they may or may not recognise that some of it's coming from a past abortion experience. Do you come across any people who aren't negatively affected by having an abortion? I've met people who have claimed that abortion hasn't affected them. And again I can't pass judgement. It certainly appears to be the quickest, most effective way of dealing with an unplanned pregnancy and so people have that perception that it will deal with it and then it will be over and then I can get back to normal. But often the reality um, isn't like that because once you've been pregnant and had an abortion you can't go back to where you were before that. You've, you're a woman who's had a pregnancy and a woman who's had an abortion. Unwanted pregnancies are not the only result of the sex culture. Promiscuous sex is often associated with sexually transmitted infections. This topic is often avoided because of its unclean nature, and this has led to the lack of general understanding of STIs. Today we're going to talk to someone with specialist knowledge on the subject, Dr. Adol Mikhail, who works at Dunedin Hospital. In your line of work, what are some of the end products that you see as a result of the sexual freedom in New Zealand? First, the exponential increase in number of abortions. About one third of all pregnancies end up in termination, and the rapid increase in the uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, uh, human papilloma virus, the virus that is responsible for causing cervical change, 99.5% of all cervical disease that lead to cancer is instigated or starts by infection with human papilloma virus, wart virus, and uh, other uh, pelvic inflammatory disease and chlamydia infections and the uh, sexual transmitted disease like chlamydia and uh, other infections, especially chlamydia, which is uh, very prevalent. Are people informed about the implications of contracting an STI? No, not at all, not at all. I mean, people now look at a world virus infection, they, they think it's, it happens to everybody. It's like cold sore, comes and goes. What are the chances of someone who's out there having casual sex contracting an STI? If a lady or a man had one flinch, one casual sex tonight, I would say that it's 50-50 chance that he would get something, he would catch something. There is nothing called 100% safe sex. What are the long-term effects? Having an STI is one part of uh, 
the side effects of a, of a casual relationship. Stop ourselves from having sex, not just because we are worried of sexually transmitted disease. Stop ourselves from having sex because of our culture, our emotional, our uh, uh, upbringing makeup. The majority of chlamydia and, and gonorrhea and all these things, the body heals. But what the body doesn't, or what the person doesn't heal from, is the emotional damage that happens, is the inability to commit, is a, in the inability to have a lifelong relationship. It was called in the past intimate relationship. No, no, there's no intimacy. If you, if you have this intimacy with 20 different people, you can't be intimate. If you get somebody who have 10, 20 different partners, you actually damage this person's ability to commit to one person. Every story has two sides. Professionals have a broad perspective from daily seeing patients in their office. But it's not the same as someone telling their own story. I've just arrived in Auckland to talk to Marina, whose experience 24 years ago continues to affect her to this day. She's the founder of The Buttons Project, collecting tokens and stories from other people to commemorate similar experiences. So far, she has received hundreds of them from people all over New Zealand. Marina, I was put in contact with you um, because I heard about the Buttons Project. Maybe you can tell us what that is. Uh, the Buttons Project basically was born out of um, my own abortion experience back when I was about 20. And I realised over the years, I found it hard to bring closure and just enabling people to either to send in a button with a bit of their story to be able to just acknowledge the baby that they aborted and realising it wasn't necessarily the quick fix that they once thought. thought. For you, Maria, you had an abortion, right? Yeah. I was 20 at that stage. Found out that I was pregnant. We spoke to a close family member and they basically said, oh, you, just get rid of it, um, it's going to hold you back, you won't get ahead in life and all these pressures and went and saw this doctor. What were you told would be the implications of, of having an abortion? I can go to work again on Monday and act as if nothing had happened. And this doctor didn't really give me any other options and or suggested anything and just basically booked me in and so talking to the counsellor there, she basically said, that's okay, you'll be all right, I'll hold your hand through the procedure. You were provided with a counsellor? Yeah, on site of the clinic. But basically she just agreed with all my fears, no kind of, well, have you thought of this? Or, you know, there's support out there. After you had the abortion, was there any implications? For me, I, my emotions shut down, so I couldn't cry, I just went numb. And even though the counsellor said that she'll be there, yes, she held my hand during the procedure and I was awake the whole time, so I, for me, I literally felt my life be sucked away. But she wasn't there afterwards. I've talked to counsellors and um, they provide services after people have had abortions. Do you think if you saw a counsellor afterwards, they would have changed things? I felt too ashamed to go back, basically, because I still felt in the end I had still made this decision to go through it, with it. And I felt ashamed of that and I also felt I've just got to live with this. And I, I think a lot of people, sometimes it, it can affect them later years down the track. Falling pregnant with another baby, like I did, um, having Hayden, seeing the ultrasound, just really hit home to me that it wasn't just a blob fetus that we aborted, it was actually a baby and this baby wasn't going to replace that one. Every time I looked at our kids, I thought they could have had another older brother or sister. I could have four kids here, not three. What would you say to someone that says an abortion is a, a quick fix? For me, abortion wasn't 
the answer in the end and caused a lot of heartache in my life. And I guess talking to others, um, I've realised that it's had an effect on their lives as well. Why tell your story? Why put your hand up and say, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to speak out and, and tell my story and, and talk about this? I still find it hard at times, like even you asking that question. And I, I think for me, I just felt that I keep hearing people on TV talking about the woman's health and different things. And I'm thinking, someone needs to know. Someone needs to speak up. And hopefully by speaking out, it will encourage others to have the courage to speak out. And just for people to know, because people aren't hearing the other side of abortion. And I just hope through my story, it will help others to find peace and healing, but also help others not go down the same track. So that was pretty intense and emotional hearing Marina's story. It was very different to any of the other conversations I've had so far. Most of the people I talk to, it's hypothetical. You could end up with an STI or an unwanted pregnancy. But after talking to Marina and hearing her story firsthand, I can really see that the decisions we make now will affect us in the long run. I've talked to professionals and I've heard people's stories. But over the next month or so, I want to head back to the streets to see if what these people have been saying is the reality out here on the streets. Women love it more than men, but they just don't want to admit it. <laughs> Some girls and guys that are <coughs> do keep it to marriage, which is amazing, but not a lot in Dunedin. <laughs> When you say it's amazing, would you, would you want to end up with a guy like that? I wish I was still a virgin. Let's just say yeah, that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> what I want to say about relationship, relationships suck. You always get fucked over because some guy likes some other girl and you get fucked over. That's my opinion on relationships. For yourself, like, do you think casual sex is the way to go? Or... Uh, I've got an ideal world, of course it's not, no. Oh, I really think that, you know, what should happen is we should just get down to the fucking A, you know? Where is the thing, like, it's like, are you down on the fuck, you know? And then you can come and have some sex. I've never been drunk and been taken advantage I of. Have. It fucking sucks. Like, like, what happens is you find a guy you think they're good, you talk to them, you, you dance to them and shit, and then what happens is you end up going home with them, and then the next day you don't get nothing. What do you look for in a relationship? Sex! Trust! Sex and drug! <laughs> Trust. Trust and respect. Sex and drugs. Yeah. Coming out of the brothel tonight, is that... Oh, no, hello, I didn't do anything up there, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, three boys here, what's the roughest thing you've, you've ever heard happen to a girl down here? Like, get thrown around by the boys, what's the roughest thing you've spit heard? Spit roast! Spit roast, eh? <laughs> that was the last night, mate. One in the puss, one in the mouth, eh? One in the mouth, mate. Spit roast. One in the puss, one in the mouth. But you said, like, you're after a relationship, and, and you're after a woman that can do, you know, love you, and, and be there for you, and, and be funny. Yeah. Do you think areas, or a place like this, is where you're going to find that? No, no, that was just like a to scratch an itch. OK. Yeah. Well, what do you mean a scratch an itch? Well, I'm, I'm not going up there to find somebody I love, I'm just going up there to scratch an itch. So if you're drunk, what does a guy have to do to take a girl home? And then it depends how drunk you are. Like, if you're drunk enough, what isn't, what, do, what doesn't guy have to do? So for you guys, what do you think you're worth? A lifetime. <laughs> Cheesy. A bit more than a root. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. If you could go back in time. Yeah, oh wow, yeah. What would you do that's different? Not cheat on the most wonderful woman on the, on the planet, yeah. 
So by now I've talked to a lot of people and I know I've got some pretty powerful footage. You know, one of the guys I talked to was Albert and he had a lot to say about culture change. So what I want to do is hit up to Timaru, show him some footage and ask him what it would take to make this happen. You know, the last time I was here, Albert, um, you gave me some contacts and since then I've been up and down this little country. I've talked to people all over the place and um, I've heard a lot of incredible stories. But tonight I'd like to share a bit of footage with you. This is something we filmed one night when we were out. And I really think that this shows the culture that we're in. It shows how we treat and handle sex and relationships. I'd like to show this to you and I'd like to get a bit of feedback. For yourself, what do you think like the average person nowadays looks to get out of a relationship? Rudy's sex, good tap, and that's about it really. Because I mean, fuck you young, go hard, eh? Is, it, is that what you want as well? Um, sometimes. Do you think... It depends about the person though, because I mean, if they're a good cunt, I'll be like, yeah, keen ass for a relationship, but if they're not, then it's like tap and gap, you know? How is rooting a relationship though? <laughs> well, you're having sexual relations with them. Rooting is sexual relations, so that's a relationship, isn't it? Yeah, but you said if he's a good cunt, then, then you're like, yeah, sweet ass. Yeah, well, if he's a good cunt and I get along with him, I can relate to him, then sweet ass, relationship, you know? I won't root no other cunt, just him. But if he's a rank cunt, then you just root him and leave, you know? What do you say, cunt? One night stand or whatever you call it, you know? Fuck. Well, obviously it's a tap and gap, isn't it? You know what I mean? Like, but you'd still be happy to just to root him and then leave? If he's not a good cunt. Well, yeah, that's... I mean, would you stay with someone that you couldn't relate to? No. Would you be like, yeah, so... But if you can't, relate to, if you can't relate to him, why would you be happy to have sex with him? Well, you're on the piss, right? You're out fucking doing your thing, and then you re meet this like hot ass dude. Like you're like, damn. Then you go home, have a chat, you know, have a root, and then find out he's a rent cunt. I mean, are you gonna stay? No. You're gonna tap and gap, is which it, is a tap and gap. <laughs> is it willing for you to take that chance to? Would I take that chance? No, no. I'm, well, you said. Well, well, obviously, obviously you yeah, are. I would. I would take that chance if he's hot. You know, you use a Joey, you're sweet. Do you reckon if he's a Joey, it's sweet every time? Probably not, but I mean, fuck, can you live your life thinking, is it all right? No. Take risks. So what would you do if met a hot guy, went back to his place, chatted, chucked on the Joey, had a root, found out that he wasn't good, two weeks later you found out you're pregnant, what would you do? Well then I'd wonder why the fuck I used the Joey because there's no point, was there? I want to have a baby to someone that I marry and all the rest of it, you know? So you want to marry someone one day? Yeah. Do you think the relationships and what you're doing now will affect your marriage one day? Probably, but I mean that's the risk you've got to take, isn't it? You're young, young, dumb, full of cum. Fuck. That's it, really. Sad really, isn't it? She deserves better. Just bad culture, bad ideology. What do you think about this? I think it's waste of uh, use of happiness, of potential, of childhood, of a country, of society, of civilization. Do you think we can solve this issue for my generation? Absolutely. This is a social problem which has to be dealt with in a clinical way. We know the cause. We have to treat the cause rather than treat the symptoms. We can keep treating your suicide, depression, family violence, road carnage, etc., etc. We have to treat the cause. The cause is a culture where it is all right to be drunk so long as you don't drive and it is all right to have sex with anybody so long as you don't get pregnant and you don't catch an STD. If this culture is not challenged, we will end up in a human paddock. If sex is a sport, you practice if you are wearing it the right, if you are wearing the right gear, we'll end up in a human paddock. And in the paddock, there, is, there are few things missing. Love, respect, commitment, and family. If our society doesn't change the way that it's currently handling sex and relationships, where do you think we'll end up? That's a very easy 
question to answer and uh, it is where other civilizations have ended up with the same way of behavior this way of thinking and acting has led in the past and could lead again to the demise of a civilization what in your opinion is the solution then the solution is that this is a social illness which has to be managed along the same way we manage medical illnesses or and disease what's happening here is that we have to understand the problem we have to understand how we are shooting ourselves in the feet in other words that changing sex education into a contraception lesson is shooting in the feet and that contraception does not protect against promiscuity and that we have to address that promiscuity is a huge problem uh, possibly bigger than unwanted pregnancy and STD and not to become shy of discussing it and then we see how to address it then we go and say okay so now we have to treat the cause not the symptoms how do we treat the cause it's better to treat the cause and it's cheaper the cheapest way is to immunize how do you immunize against this you immunize against this by the strict discrediting by stigmatizing promiscuity and substance abuse how do you do that by discrediting the ideology that in the pursuit of happiness people have to be drunk and laid with people whom they even don't know whom they met in the last 10 minutes that we have to discredit the ideology that if you remember what happened yesterday you did not have enough fun how do we do that we have to stigmatize this way of thinking how do we do that by working at all levels by captainship of the problem and ownership of the management at all levels hope should not be our only strategy while we are watching our children and grandchildren walking into a minefield ushered by bad culture and by their friends who are putting a lot of pressure on them to follow suit the government has to step in identify the problem identify that we have to treat the cause use the structures of the school and the community agents to address the problem and help to prevent it. If that is really the solution, do you think anyone will actually do it? I think so, and I'm challenging everybody saying, give me the ears, the eyes and the hearts of the nation for one hour and let them think of their children, and yes, they will all contribute. If I gave you 30 seconds right now to speak to this nation, what would you say? Let me put it to you this way. Who wants to see the children drunk in the gutters and falling around every weekend and not knowing whom they sleep with? Who wants their daughter to be treated like a you, a you in the paddock? I think it is time for a change and I think change can be achieved and I think we have the way to achieve it. It's just a matter of diagnosing the problem and treating it and preventing it and having the courage and the will to know that we are going in the wrong direction and that the sooner we do the U-turn the better. Over the last two and a half years I've had some really eye-opening conversations. Meeting these people has really brought to light how our current generation is living and the consequences they will have to face down the line. I've done my best to take an honest approach to the topic of sex and relationships in New Zealand. I've talked to as many people as I can who are a part of this culture. From medical professionals right through to the average teenager on the nightlife. Dr. Makari talked about families as the building blocks of society. If we are, as he says, heading towards de-civilization through sexual promiscuity. Maybe it's time we start to address this issue as a nation. When I started making this documentary, I wanted to find out about sex and relationships. Having done this, I've realized that the issues I've uncovered are the product of a mindset that places freedom and fun above all other values. For the effort, I don't believe that this generation is getting either freedom or fun. If you don't believe me, I'll finish with the stats that speak for themselves.